Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this session on financing the commons. Um, my name is Susan Sparks. I am a health economist with the Department of Health Systems Governance and Financing in WHO Geneva. Um, so I think it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night if you're some of our panelists. Um, so thank you very much for joining. So I'm just going to pull up my screen. Okay. Hopefully this is sharing. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction before turning the session over to our esteemed group of speakers and colleagues. Um, so first, uh, this is a reconvening of a group in many respects. And so we're reconvening um, after work that had been done and started in 2017 and 2018 related to um, the, what we call common goods for health. And so um, the work program was developed um, really as a, a joint effort between WHO, but a group of technical experts that represents economists, public health um, specialists, and um, really policymakers, practitioners. Um, and it was developed because there was a concern that there were potential what we call blind spots or there was potential underinvestments in certain areas of what we call common goods for health, um, which I will define. And so what this program was launched as part of the UN um, high level meeting on UHC in September, 2018. Um, and as part of that, we also developed um, a special issue um, of health systems and reform that can be seen here. And the articles um, really dig deep into the definitions, the concepts, but also the what and the how and the why associated with um, both financing and implementation challenges um, around some of these population-based functions that really are at the core of universal health coverage, health security, and, and many other important agendas. And so here I just want to provide a, a quote that comes from the um, the introduction to the special journal issue. And it says, a recent, mind you, this is September 2019. So in recent decades, overall health outcomes have been improving and spending on health has increased substantially. However, blind spots persist and these pose substantial risks to the human health and economic well-being. Indeed, they have the potential to undo recent progress. These blind spots include unable to effectively respond to pandemics such as influenza and then it goes on. And so this is really a prescient call to action and many of the, the much of the motivation behind this was to say um, how can as part of the UHC movement but also as part of a lot of the discussions around preparedness and environmental protection and health security how can we come together in terms of defining a core group of, of um, of functions that are really stand as the foundation for a lot of the interventions um, and a lot of the response functions that we know are really important in the protection functions. And so common goods for health. So I'll give the boring definitions so the speakers can go a lot more into the interesting details and um, in the specific topic areas. And so these are population-based functions or interventions that require public financing based on market failures. And so um, this is coming from the economics um, perspective and the economists within WHO, um, and that these contribute to human health and economic progress, but also the provision or preservation of these common goods are subject to market failures. And that's really important because this is inherently a public financing. Um, so prepaid, pooled, collective um, resources, resources um, that in some cases will be supplemented by donor funds. And they typically um, are because they're either public goods, so in the traditional sense, or they also have large social externalities. And they typically fall within five categories, policy and coordination, taxes and subsidies, regulation and legislation, information analysis, communication, and population services. So this is waste management and um, water and sanitation related issues. So that's the, that's the conceptual introduction. So before I hand it over to the speakers, I wanted to make sure I walk you th through some of the functionalities um, in terms of the screen, um, in terms of the, the virtual portal. So first, please use the Q&A. 
to type either general questions or specific questions for specific speakers as we're going through. We'll generally run through the different um, presentations, but if there is a very specific clarification question, um, I can come in and raise that to a speaker before moving on to the next one. I will try to be very on top of the, the time management as long as, as well as the speakers, um, because we really want to allow for this time for discussion following um, the various presentations, because this is really a, a really important agenda and spans across a lot of different topics. Um, and then there's also the discussion forum in which um, discussion can take place um, throughout the presentations as well. So I'll let each speaker um, present themselves, um, but just to say we have a really fantastic group here. So we'll start with Professor David Peters and then Dr. Tolbert Nianzwa and Dr. Grace Achungura and then Gavin Yami, Dr. Gavin Yami, and then Alexander Earl, and then um, Dr. Awad Mataria, um, and as well as uh, Joe Cutson, um, who is my boss, uh, be coming in with some discussion and, and closing remarks as well. Um, so now I'm happy to turn over the session to uh, Dr. David Peters um, to talk about the um, Common Goods for Health in the context of emergency and disaster risk management. Well, good morning or uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, my name is uh, David Peters. I'm a professor and chair of the uh, Department of International Health. I am also a uh, chair of the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, which is uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of the um, uh, of the conference and delighted to be here. Uh, hopefully you're seeing my screen now and um, what I'm going to be uh, talking about is, uh, as, as Susan said, health emergency disaster risk management. It is a little bit awkward talking about the cost of uh, preventing and responding to uh, health emergencies uh, in the midst of a historic pandemic. Uh, but uh, just to, to note that this analysis was actually done prior to COVID and not surprisingly showed that, uh, will show that um, that small amounts of investment in uh, these common goods for health uh, are really quite, uh, have huge paybacks con con compared to their costs. So uh, when you look at the cost of disasters, it's really uh, the best known costs are really from the major disasters, typically from storms, floods, fires, and those kind of uh, insurable events. Uh, and uh, this slide basically shows over the years in the dark green how these particularly climate related events, uh, disasters have been increasing. So now about $170 billion a year. Um, whenever the social costs, the, ex the uh, external or indirect costs related to disasters have been measured, they are at least or typically larger than the direct costs. And then if you add the cost of smaller disasters, um, you're already at $450 billion a year. We'll talk more about pandemics, but as you can see from the data, they're really quite variable and, and difficult to actually assess the full range of costs. Uh, this graphic here just shows that uh, how variable, but over the course of years, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people are affected every year by disasters. So this is not, these are not rare phenomena. We're not talking about once in a century pandemics uh, alone. These are everyday uh, disasters of major scale. When you actually look at the costs of pandemics, again, very difficult to measure, but here's some estimates. Uh, again, these are in the billions of dollars. Uh, for uh, five of the most recent uh, pandemics and uh, major epidemics of uh, this millennium. Uh, but as you might guess, they actually pale in comparison to the costs of COVID-19, of course, is, is ongoing. Uh, it's really literally off the scale. And currently, I think we're looking at uh, estimates of uh, loss of global GDP of in the range of four and a half uh, percent of global GDP. But this estimate just from the United States uh, by David Cutler and Larry Summers showed it as a $16 trillion virus where the, when you include the costs uh, to GDP and health losses, just enormous levels. And here they're looking at 90% of the annual GDP of the US in terms of costs. Of course, there are many different kinds of, uh, of uh, policy choices people are making, but also different kinds of costs. Here's 
uh, looking at some of these, it's not just about the COVID costs, which are enormous enough related to illness, death, and the costs of treatment and vaccines, but huge economic effects that we're seeing, you know, unemployment and lost business, and certainly uh, the uh, pulling out the inequities involved, both as cause and as consequence of this kind of disaster. In addition, there's huge costs uh, and actions to be taken around other kinds of well being, whether it's related to psychological harm or increases in difficulties in addressing domestic violence, but certainly worsening of non COVID related illnesses and ability to respond. And then finally, just showing a set of um, both interrelated. Um, uh, causes and and uh, and costs and and areas of activity around uh, social political trade-offs. Certainly, social capital and public trust are critical to response and preparation. But certainly, we've seen uh, also the costs of this in terms of unrest and uh, polarization. And I would add uh, that regime change. Although you know, sitting on this side of the world. Uh, regime change isn't necessarily a bad thing or a cost, but uh, uh, but you know in many contexts it will be looked at that way by um, by policymakers. Um, what we did in this uh, study is we did look at the costs of uh, really the basic functional level to be in each of these six areas of common goods for health and health emergencies disaster risk management. Um, and what we did was we assessed what it does, what it costs for all of low and middle uh, income countries around the world for these uh, five areas, or six areas rather. And uh, what we found uh, coming to the results of cumulatively is that really they are quite affordable. Now, yes, uh, this cost shows that it is $26 billion for all low and middle income countries. And we had nearly 70 countries to estimate it from. Uh, but that that's the... Uh, one, that's the capital in one year recurrent cost. But what you can see is even from the conservative estimates of disaster costs pre-COVID, this is about 1 20th of the costs of, of, uh, of global disasters. And you can see the per capita cost ranging from averaging $5, uh, but really going from 2.7 to eight and a half dollars, uh, depending on the country you're living in. Or, now we did look at the costs across the full range of health emergency disaster risk management, looking at not just the hazards and the exposure and vulnerability that, uh, that people have, but again, looking at the full cycle of health emergency uh, disaster risk management. But I do wanna point out that the costing we did was really on the prevention, preparedness, and the initial response. The actual cost of recovery is not what we have included, uh, nor the costs of the actual clinical costs of treatment. So we focus, those costs I'm talking about are really about preparedness and prevention, but are part of a bigger cycle. And one of the things they cost is actually about being able to have the um, incident management systems that include emergency operations center that are staffed and uh, and have the systems and material to provide these at national and then at, at local levels. This here is a picture of one that one of our next speakers, uh, Tobin Nanswa, set up on the fly during Ebola, but it's a standard type of, uh, of organizational and uh, operational response. And we did not just uh, look at what the, uh, the direct costs of these are, but also at sort of the organizational responses that are needed. So here you see some of the functionalities that need to be put in place and responsibilities uh, in an emergency disaster risk management system. But we also looked at how they should be organized uh, beyond the actual structure. And some of the things that we, we took away, largely, frankly, from the um, climate-related disaster work where this is better documented, is the need to have uh, pro appropriate rules, regulations, addressing behavioral norms, and have organizational structures that match the kind of uh, responsibilities and activities. So a highlight in red are just a few of these things. Providing a legal mandate for response and recovery agencies is, is actually critical and not done in a lot of countries. Behaviorally, you need to look at uh, having outreach and information source uh, systems that use mechanisms that people actually use with appropriate messengers, but also having frontline workers that are well-trained and empowered to take action. Coordination is a huge uh, issue and, and um, 
better done before you actually have the disaster and required a type of uh, multi-layered inclusive and uh, participatory well-trained organizations. So what I'm showing here is a slide about why some of this multi-agency coordination is needed. We're quite, uh, uh, quite familiar with having national to local levels of units, but also having different kinds of geographical, political units, administrative units, or even healthcare catchment areas, but also have to recognize there's many organizations involved, not just hospitals and, and uh, emergency response, but regulatory bodies and civil society ag agencies, and a lot of functional cross um, uh, cross government issues, for example, cross sectoral issues that go well beyond ministries of health, as you could tell from some of the uh, issues we've talked about already in COVID. And here's from another paper in the series just describing this problem in India, just called it polycentrism, but it's really about addressing some of these uh, overlapping and incomplete uh, responsibilities, the connection to having financing. Uh, and uh, and be able to have appropriate jurisdictions to be able to address them. So to be able to do that, you need to have a kind of learning approach which is adapted to the systems. So here you see a typical type of uh, learning cycle which is needed, uh, but what we're finding is, is it's critical that they be done not just within technical units, but across units, across all of government, uh, also bring in civil society and business and NGOs into the field and particularly moving beyond this technical uh, learning to what we call a uh, double loop or social learning with broader stakeholders to keep looking at the parameters so you're looking in the right places. There is a research agenda. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but it's not just about assessing the appropriate costs and benefits, but also looking at different models and, and testing their interventions, and particularly in a more integrated way. I would say focusing on implementation research, not just about things that can be done in, in controlled settings with looking at single outputs, but in real world settings and looking at how you actually implement them and, and how you learn and adapt. And so in, in conclusion, you know, it's really clear that the economic and social value of uh, health emergency disaster risk management is really infant and tiny compared to the actual costs of not acting, and that you do need to have all hands on deck in government and civil society and business to be able to address them, and that there are both um, institutional options that are feasible, and again, reinforcing that uh, investment in these systems strengthen our ability to prepare and respond uh, to disasters and improve well-being. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair. Wonderful. Thanks so much, David. Uh, so now I think we can turn this to Tolbert. So uh, thank you. Thank you, and uh, uh, Susan. I think uh, David has said it very well. I'm, I'm Tolbert. Talbot Nyuswa, uh, I work with David uh, in the Department of International Health as Senior Research Associate there. So David, David is my boss. As you, you before joining uh, John Hopkins, uh, was the Deputy Minister of Health of Liberia and then established the National Public Health Institute that I ran for, for almost three years and led the Ebola crisis. So, I'm, I'm giving, David has just laid it, the, the point very well from, from an evidence-based perspective. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, what I intend to do and the take-home message that I heard was, was that it is, it is affordable by low middle income countries to invest and the, uh, uh, the not investing have a catastrophic effect. So what I, what I tried to do here this morning, attempt to do is to lay out the before, during an emergency and after and rebuilding better you know, health system and how you can allocate and what are the obstacles for prioritizing, financing common goods of health a population-based health functions. Next slide. Basically using the West Africa and Liberia experience. The, the lessons that we learned and those lessons are very, very valuable. Uh, today and uh, on, on COVID-19 and what is going on. And just to reflect your mind with the West Africa Ebola epidemic, uh, things that we know that turn around the epidemic for just to reflect your mind, 
uh, in West Africa, when Ebola struck 2014, 2016, we had over 28,000 cases, 11,000 deaths. Uh, but we saw a tail of two epidemics. Number one, the one that happened between 2014, 2015, and there were flare ups of other outbreaks that happened when we invested in the systems that are common goods for health services in the population. Huge outbreak, 28,000 cases, 11,000 deaths, but with another flood up, we were able to manage that and continue the outbreak with less than, less than uh, uh, 10 deaths and, and few, few, fewer, fewer cases. And what worked was, what works well from lessons we learned was engaging the community, which is which is very, very crucial. Behavior can change a lot of things. You, you generate sanitation and hygiene, uh, critical issues, let's like safe barriers in the case of Ebola, uh, strong political leadership. I've always said uh, there is no substitute for, for political leadership. We've seen countries that have, have done well in COVID-19 respond with coherent messages, one communication strategy, one plan, one response has worked very, very well. So it's important for, for political leadership. Next slide. So what are the challenges and constraints in investing in common goods for health? What are some of the obstacles? With the Liberian as an experience, uh, government budget, very, very small, the priorities, are so many taxes are earmarked. Only 38% of government resources support health. Uh, we also saw donor fragmentation resources go into disease specific programs as compared to uh, uh, moving into the national health plan, pooling the resources to support the national health plan. So it was, it was important. Uh, donors were supporting specific diseases, for example, UNICEF was concentrating on, on immunizations, vaccine preventable diseases, uh, global fund with HIV, TB, malaria. You have to talk about uh, USAID with the President Malaria Initiative. So these funding were going directly to specific programs and not supporting health systems and who bears the brunt are the end users. So by, by putting into a national health plan an essential package for health services, Having one plan, one program, one policy can, can help in shifting and bridging the gap of the obstacles that have to do with supporting health system. Next slide. So for, for example, some of the convergence and how you prioritize is looking at education, putting in place immunization services, putting in place nutritional services, water and sanitation, once you can prioritize these issues and convergence and common goods for financing these services can have enormous impact. And what we saw also is that you cannot separate primary healthcare services from global health security or supporting health security initiatives. Countries that have invested in the global health security agenda, building system, the surveillance data system, coordinating with primary healthcare system have seen enormous impact, even in COVID-19 have had lesser cases as compared to those who do not invest in, uh, but more research is needed to empirically uh, validate this. Next slide. So what is important about IHR, the International Health Regulation of 2005? IHR is a long-term process, but countries need to invest in IHR. For example, if you want to do very well in health security and protect the population, uh, develop and strengthen national health capacities, uh, develop IHR system plans that support and report on time and collect, collect data. Uh, one of the important tools for the IHR is the international is the National Action Planning for Health Security, which is a countrywide effort, multi-year planning effort. And when David mentioned that some of the, the resources for emergency disaster management comes in one part with the National Action Plan for, for Health Security Development. Next slide. So building back better, I told you 
uh, I saw firsthand how a health system looks like before, during, and after the crisis. The Ebola crisis, we saw our health system in, in Liberia. After the Ebola crisis, we were able to, uh, during the Ebola crisis, we saw the collapse of the entire health systems, healthcare workers, uh, kill clinics, services, immunization services, maternal and child health services, reproductive health services, all of those broke down because of uh, the one, one disease. We've seen similar thing in COVID-19 with healthcare systems that are overwhelmed. And so for you to build back better, you have to use uh, prioritize external resources and all of that. So one of the take home message moving forward, COVID-19 national plans should focus on prioritizing and anticipate revision in the healthcare, uh, national health plan and national policies. What we did when we looked after Ebola was to see that the health system was not in a red frame to deal with high consequence pathogens. So we were able to recalibrate, review the health plan and uh, develop, uh, develop another national investment plan that we thought would bridge the gap between health security and primary healthcare system. With that, there is in those areas, new regions, we've seen that they have done better when responding to COVID-19 as compared to when health systems are not, are not invested in. So we, we, the Ebola crisis has reawakened all of us that investing in common goods for health is the way forward that can protect populations. Next, thank you. Thank you, Tolbert. Um, I think it was a really interesting example of uh, lessons from Ebola, but I think also um, hard lessons that uh, in terms of progress, it'll be interesting in the discussion to find out how much has been actually addressed following the Ebola crisis as well. Um, so now I'd like to, to turn to Grace Achangura to provide some more detailed reflections from India. Grace, are you there? It, it looks like Grace, Grace had been having some connection problems and so she's been coming in and out. Uh, so I think um, we'll hope that she can join back in. But uh, if Gavin, if you are available to speak, oh, she's just joined back in. Let's give one minute to see if Grace is able to join. Grace, are you available? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, um, my name is Delhi, India. I work with the WHO in India and I'll be presenting on uh, some lessons on common goods for to run through the situation. Grace, unfortunately, your your internet connection doesn't seem to be stable, so you're not coming through. And then what we are seeing in the aftermath and some reflections on that. Okay, stop the video. Does that improve it? Hello. Hello. It's Grace. When I stop the video, does it is it better? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Let's try that. Um, Thanks. Okay. So just by background. Um, Currently, we are at 
million cases. Great. Unfortunately, it's still... seeing a downward trend in the number of active cases and nations. Am I still in Um Okay, let, let's give it one more try and then... <laughs> okay. Okay. Are you there, Grace? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I was saying that we're at about, um, we've seen about 10.8 million lives affected by COVID. Although the good news is that we are, and we are seeing a downward tick in the number of cases um, currently. And this is happening in the context of um, a highly populated country. So you can imagine with the population dynamics, what that has meant for transmission and the efforts that have had to be put in place to bring down those numbers. Secondly, India is a decentralized country, meaning that there are various levels of government, each with different responsibilities uh, regarding health in general, but also in particular regarding surveillance, as we shall see later. And so that has set the context for how um, surveillance for COVID-19 has happened. Lastly, the pandemic has happened in the context of a relatively underfunded health system with um, outlays on uh, health from the government uh, coming to just below 1.2% um, of GDP, uh, which is the lowest in the in the Southeast Asian region, but also a uh, 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 financing landscape that is heavily privatized with out-of-pocket coming under just 60%. But we've seen that in the last one year, the government made a lot of stepping up in terms of investing in um, managing the pandemic with about $1.7 billion put towards the uh, emergency response. Um, the timeline of surveillance in India starts with 1995 following two outbreaks of um, cholera and plague um, in 1998 and 1992 with the National Apical Advisory Committee. And we've since seen a slew of uh, one, on one hand, a, uh, a national surveillance program that is now managed by the, Na the National Center for Diseases Control. But we've also seen some disease specific surveillance. Uh, system, so like the HIV uh, Sentinel surveillance system that started in 1992 but came up to full scale nationwide in 2002. A watershed moment was the Integrated Disease Surveillance Project, which was funded initially by, by the World Bank, but the government took it over completely in 2012 and it became the Infectious Disease Surveillance Program managed by the National Center for Diseases Control and it has been looking at 22 conditions. But lately, um, with the support of WHO, the government is moving towards an even greater integrated health information platform designed to get real-time data supported by GIS systems. Um, and so that one is looking at 33 plus diseases. Um, the responsibility for surveillance, like largely from the policy and strategic perspective, it comes from the central level with the states managing most of the inter um, implementation because state is a, health is a state subject in India. And then you have the district surveillance units coming in managing some laboratory uh, networks. Of course, because um, India is a very big country with over 36, with 36 states and union territories, the capacity in surveillance varies largely by the program you're looking at one, but also by state. Um, the India Center for Medical Research is one that manages a huge network of laboratories for diagnostic purposes. So we have about 106 viral uh, research and diagnostic laboratories and then 35 diagnostic centers. Like I said, there are other um, uh, siloed approaches and so the tuberculosis um, surveillance unit is one of them. Uh, one of the inputs that came up recently that I think is going to be a huge big um, game changer for surveillance in the country is the National Digital Health Blueprint, which is really looking at in, um, aggregating all uh, forms of health information um, um, in one place through the National Digital Health Mission. This is person-centered um, um, 
information that would help in, in, in providing real time um, data. It was launched in 2019. And then also the other thing that they are doing that um, one of the other inputs they have, the public health institutes that are being used to train um, epidemiologists for um, field epidemiologists for surveillance, but also the government has been putting in quite a bit of money um, even before the COVID-19 outbreak to help um, man, uh, fund, fund the, the, the surveillance through the NCDC and ICMR. During COVID, just focusing largely on the testing as one of the areas under surveillance, um, India started off with only one lab in Pune that was doing testing in 2020, uh, in February 2020. But now, at least as of the 4th of February 2021, there are 2,366 laboratories. And as you can see, there's a complement of government laboratories and the private sector. So, and real attempt to involve the private sector as much as possible in shoring up the capacity there. And as, um, as you can see now, we're almost at um, 200 million tests done um, with a capacity of about 715,000 tests conducted daily. Uh, and you can see following around May is when we had the high, the, we began to see a ramp up in the level of testing as um, indigenous tests came up uh, and, and uh, more capacity for laboratories was built. What are the challenges that we saw during the, the, major, the, the peak of the COVID-19 um, outbreak? There was patchy surveillance. We, we realized that Yes, there have been attempts to um, put in place surveillance systems, but these were very patchy, in some cases not comprehensive. So a lot of pilot projects that not got, did not get scaled up due to inadequate funding and in some cases due to lack of political will, frankly speaking. Uh, but also um, a huge verticalization of efforts in surveillance, which led to some um, uh, programs like the HIV, TB, RMNCAH really well showed up, well funded, well developed, and others like NCDs not well um, uh, funded and, and whose capacity is still lacking. But then also some duplication of data collection efforts between ICMR and um, the National Control Disease Center for Disease Control that manages the Integrated Disease Surveillance uh, Program, the National Vector Control Disease Program, collecting data, similar data, but no, in, no synergies in between, no communication in between. Uh, and so that initially created a little bit of confusion at the beginning, uh, which was later resolved. Another one, of course, is the issues around inadequate human resources for surveillance, um, limited use of digital options, and like I alluded to earlier, lack of integration for NCDs. Now, what is the government doing post-COVID-19 to shore up the surveillance capacity? As you can see on the right, uh, the government has come up with a vision 2035, specifically dealing with public health surveillance in India and has set in place some key action areas that they want to put in place, one of which has been operationalized through the launch of the what they call Pradhan Mantri Atmani Bar Swat Bharat Yojana pro, uh, flagship program that the Prime Minister launched um, in 2021. This one is really tra tackling uh, surveillance holistically. Like Tolbert said in his previous side, one of the things that they learned in Liberia was shoring up primary health care. And that's one of the things they're doing here, ramping up the investment on the rural and urban health and wellness centers. And that will be where frontline um, for, for surveillance through the primary health care units will be um, coming in. So investing heavily in there, investing in public health laboratories in all the districts and at the public, at the block level, which is lower than the district public health units in at least seven, 11 states. They are also strengthening the NCDC and its branches. They are expanding the, inter in the, the integrated health information platform. That one that I told you is really looking at um, providing real-time data uh, um, so that it in, in informs evidence, planning and, 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 and um, 
surveillance in real time. So this is going to be to all states to connect all the public health labs. Operationalization of the pipe of, of some pu um, public health units, especially at the points of entry, and then also setting up a national institution for One Health, and this shall include also a regional research platform for WHO Southeast Asia region. And the government is really intentional about it. In the recently um, released uh, budget on the first of February, uh, it was announced that they are putting almost 9.62 billion. Um, for just this program, and this will be an outlay over six years. Other investments are the National Digital Health Mission. Um, this one is managed by the National Health Authority, which also runs the health insurance scheme. And this is going to operationalize the national digital, is operationalizing the national digital health blueprint that brings everything, information system, surveillance, mortality data, and everything together to inform evidence. It leverages the existing platforms, including IDSP and IHIP. And the government has, of course, this year also allocated some funding for that in the budget, about 4.1 million for the rollout. This is at the central level. Um, the financing mechanism for this is, is uh, India has different financing mechanisms that enable the state, the central level to interact with the state uh, and influence policy at that level. So this is one of them whereby there's state co-financing with the central level um, for a particular program. So for some of them, it's usually 60% managed by the center, 40% by the state. For the poorest states, 90% by the center, 10% by the, um, by the poorer state. And so this will, of course, require state co-financing and buy-in. So in terms of reflecting, this is my last slide on um, the surveillance going forward, what I think it looks like. I think we are, it's fairly optimistic. The government is in putting in place the enabling policy framework uh, for surveillance that will carry them for the next uh, at least 15 years. There is political will with increased investment at least for the next six years. However, within the context of fiscal decentralization and the financing arrangements, there really needs to be um, that corporate federal, cooperative federalism, whereby you have the state and the center agreeing on how um, the programs will run with the states buying in so that you ensure you do not have patchy uptake because with patchy uptake should a problem, a problem have happen in one state that may not have bought into the center's vision, then it means it's a problem for the rest of the country. And then with regard to the public financial management for surveillance, um, I think um, in terms of whether it provides an enabling environment, even within the COVID outbreak uh, at the peak of it, we could see this, the system allows for reprogramming of funds across um, programs, which is good, even though it's an administrative classification of the budget, um, but also it's, it, it, there is a performance element to it that encourages the, the, the government to work towards a particular outcome, so introducing a bit of accountability. So with at least there's one target in, in, in the output and output framework on, on, the, on the rollout for IDSP with the target coming to 90%. So hopefully with the increased investments, uh, we will see some more action there. Uh, there'll be greater need for multi-sectoral action, especially with regard to the One Health Agenda. And so um, that is something that the Ministry of Health is pretty keen on building up during this uh, time. But there's also a need to increase investment in human resources for surveillance, which according to the union budget was not so much this year. And with that, allow me to sign off. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Grace. I think the, the themes around fragmentation, um, both across kind of disease programs and um, pr across the health sector, but also this issue of how to mobilize political support um, an action when you're in a, in a decentralized setting is particularly um, critical in terms of um, the common goods for health. And I think now we're going to broaden it out to the next level of um, coordination difficulties um, with Gavin Yami talking more about the, the global common goods for health.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Uh, just checking that you can see me and hear me okay? Yes. Great. Hello everybody, my name is Gavin Yamey. I'm a professor of global health and public policy at Duke University, where I direct a center called the Center for Policy Impact in Global Health. Uh, one of our big focuses is the financing of global health, the architecture, the delivery. And so this is a topic very much dear to my heart. And as Susan said, I am going to take a more global view, a more bird's eye view uh, of common goods for health, focusing on global common goods for health. We have in our team and also in the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health, called them global functions, uh, also known as international collective action for health. And I wanted to just start with the kind of conceptual framework. What is it that I'm talking about? I'm talking about activities that have transnational benefits, addressing transnational issues. And we can categorize them in three ways, supporting global public goods for health, developing new health products, setting standards, market shaping, fostering global health leadership and stewardship, something that the WHO does so well, convening co for consensus building, for example, uh, health and cross-sectoral advocacy on things like trade and education. And then uh, high on all of our minds, uh, managing cross-border regional and global externalities, classically pandemic response, uh, pandemic preparedness, but also tackling antimicrobial resistance and curbing the cross-border marketing of unhealthy goods, tobacco, sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, and so on. We argue in our paper in the special collection that there is enormous value in investing in these global common goods for health. We've heard from many of the panelists today, the cost of inaction is very large. Uh, one estimate is that over the next two years, the global economy will lose $8.5 trillion. The returns to investing in these goods are enormous. If you take the polio vaccine, the initial investment was about $26 million from the March of Dimes. And if you look at the US alone, the polio vaccination campaign has averted 160,000 polio deaths. Uh, 1.1 million cases of paralytic polio with treatment cost savings in the US alone of 180 billion. So we know that product development has a very large return on investment. That's going to be true of the HIV vaccine. Every dollar that we invest could return up to $67, uh, according to research by Rob Hecht and Dean Jameson. If we take market shaping again, very impressive returns back in 2001, there was only one manufacturer supplying the pentavalent vaccine and it was $3.50 per dose. And thanks to Gavi's market shaping, uh, by 2017, there were five suppliers and the cost had come down. The lowest cost was 68 cents per dose. We also argue in our paper that this kind of investment uh, could potentially be less fungible. It could benefit low and middle income countries more than the direct funding of services by donors. Those services obviously matter and we're certainly not saying they shouldn't be an investment for donors, but we do know that every dollar invested uh, in external funding into the health sector is associated with, on average, 44 cent reduction in domestic health spending. Uh, external financing for global common goods for health is likely to be less Fungible, for example, for surveillance for zoonotic disease or the control of regional uh, multidrug resistant TB. It could also help address the so-called middle income dilemma. Many middle income countries have now reached the GDP ca per capita. That means that they're no longer eligible for aid, um, but the international community could still help the poorest populations in those middle income countries by supporting these goods research and development for diseases of poverty, market shaping to bring, to bring down the prices of drugs and vaccines. Uh, and lastly, that graduation that I talked about of middle income countries is actually going to potentially free up 
uh, health ODA that could be allocated to global common goods for health. I wanted to just note that actually you can invest in these global common goods for health at multiple different levels of the system. Um, the most obvious is at the global supranational level investments in, for example, CEPI or stockpile, stockpiling or the PEF, uh, the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility. But you can also invest at the regional level, investments in Africa CDC, for example, regional malaria initiatives. And you can also invest in global goods at the country level, because if you eliminate malaria, for example, or tackle drug resistant TB in a country that has transnational benefits. We estimated in our work the financing gap for these global common goods for health. And actually, the numbers are painfully low when we think about the economic losses from COVID-19. You know, keep that $8.5 trillion number in your head. And you can see um, that, uh, you know, 11 and a half billion in total for this whole range of functions, product development, pandemic preparedness. Uh, the SANS Commission estimated that it would have cost just $3.4 billion a year uh, for national and global and regional strengthening of preparedness. Um, and here are some other estimates, malaria eradication, $2 billion a year. So a relatively small amount of funding, we know that if you look at all external financing for health, only about a fifth is for these common goods for health, these global common goods for health. Certainly our research has shown, this is in another paper in the same collection, that the proportion of total external funding, donor, donor funding for global common goods for health goes up after a pandemic or epidemic as it did after Ebola in West Africa, but then it shrinks again so-called cycles of panic and neglect. And we have to do something to break these cycles. Perhaps uh, COVID-19 will be the breaking point to break the fever and you know, get, get the world to see the necessity of ongoing funding. And the last thing I want to just uh, point to are ways in which we could close the gap. And just as we think about the national health system, mobilizing resources, pooling them and strategic purchasing, you can use the same framework for global common goods for health, mobilizing resources through, for example, compulsory mechanisms, unit aid uh, funded by, by, by a tax on airline tickets, voluntary earmarked mechanisms like CEPI and reallocating ODA, ODA after graduation. There are attempts to pool funding for these global common goods for health. For example, pooled research and development funds, global coordination platforms, and now new global public goods windows at the multilateral level. And lastly, through strategic purchasing, for example, by Gavi or the Global Fund and its strategic initiatives or IDA funding regional surveillance. I want to apply that lens to thinking about a global public good on everybody's mind, which is COVID-19 vaccines. At the start of this pandemic, you heard from so many world leaders like Macron, this is going to be a global public good. Lovely words, lovely rhetoric, very heartening. Of course, what we have seen is something that has been called vaccine apartheid with the rich world monopolizing the supply of vaccine. Is it really the global public good? Uh, I would argue that although there are going to be different ways in which low and middle income countries uh, are supplied or acquire vaccines, it really is still down in many ways to COVAX, the global pooled mechanism, really the only global multilateral platform that can enable anything close to global access equity, says my colleague Krishna Udaya Kumar uh, here at Duke. And right now, COVAX has a relatively small supply of doses, about a billion doses compared to five to six billion doses that the uh, high and upper middle income countries have acquired. So lastly, again, if you, if you take that framework that I mentioned of resource mobilization, pooling and purchasing, I think there is some urgency to close the COVAX gap. Uh, for example, funding CEPI's portfolio, funding the COVAX advanced market commitment that is going to purchase doses for the so-called funded nations, the COVAX AMC, nations in pooling, of course, 
um, uh, making sure that uh, rich nations actually donate doses to the pool, uh, share know-how processes manufacturing and through uh, the, the CTAP, the technology access pool for COVID-19 pool data and IP. And then of course, uh, market shaping and pool procurement uh, from Gavi. Uh, the last thing I would just say is that in all of this, WHO has a critical role as the overarching conductor of the orchestra, if you like, uh, we will always struggle if we continue to finance WHO through voluntary contributions, which are heavily earmarked. Uh, they make up 80% of, of WHO's funding. If we want it to be doing its core functions, the things that it does so well, we are going to need to change that balance. And as we said in the Commission on Investing in Health, WHO is really struggling to fund those core functions and that is gonna to continue to undermine uh, the capacity to supply global public goods for health. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, certainly some very relevant and pressing um, uh, issues to, to think about and um, hopefully see some action on soon. Um, so now I'm going to turn it to my colleague, Alex Earle, to give some reflections because as part of this program of work, um, the environmental common goods for health were, are part of this issue. And so it's bringing together really the, the environment, the universal health coverage, the health security agendas to think um, much more strategically in terms of investment and engagement uh, with finance. So over to you, Alex. Yeah, great. Thanks, Susan. Um, so my name is Alex Earle. I'm a technical officer in the Department of Health Systems Governance and Financing at the World Health Organization. And I've been involved with the Common Goods for Health agenda for a couple of years now. Um, and I just want to spend my five minutes that I have kind of highlighting um, that because there's a lot of actions that lie outside of the health system, but that equally impact health, um, we've included these environmental common goods for health under the remit of this agenda, um, and that we're not just focused on pandemic preparedness um, and health system strengthening, but also kind of these larger issues on preserving and protecting the environment um, that might have a positive impact on health. And so today we've kind of, we've been using this COVID-19 example to really set the immediate context for this agenda. And, um, We've had a number of presentations that have all really highlighted a number of critical functions that are all essential for the COVID-19 response. Um, but I also wanna highlight that a number of these functions are also gonna be needed to address actions to combat environmental health issues as well. And so I have here, um, if I can get to my next slide, I have here a few examples on what I mean by environmental common goods for health. Um, so we have the setting standards, policies, and targets for things such as water and sanitation, um, for things as well such as air quality, and importantly, environmental health surveillance systems and monitoring of major health risks and different zoonotic diseases, as well interoperable information systems, and so you can kind of start to get a feel of the um, cross-cutting nature of these functions and that they're not only critical for the uh, immediate short-term concerns that we have, but also will help increase the resilience to future impacts of environmental concern. And as Susan uh, presented at the very beginning of this, sec uh, this session, they, these environmental common goods for health al also suffer from inherent market failures and thus it's critical for uh, environment or for government action to really prioritize and implement these functions. Um, but we know that there's a lot of countries, however, that uh, fail to really prioritize these environmental actions, even though we know that strong governance and coordination is really imperative um, for the improved performance of environmental health outcomes. And furthermore, interestingly, a lot of these environmental common goods for health are gonna be sitting outside the health sector, but the health sector can still play a critical role in for say, providing the evidence base, um, also monitoring progress and helping to coordinate across sectors. 
So now that I've kind of laid down the motivation for why we've included these environmental common goods for health into our agenda, I just wanted to turn quickly to provide a few examples of how we've seen with COVID-19, um, how countries have used this window of opportunity uh, to aid in their environmental action into recovery packages for the economy um, as well into their budget. So first, um, to use France as an example, uh, they have really been adopting these green budgeting tools to identify spending in their recovery plan that is environmentally compatible. And they've also been working to better align budgetary processes with broader environmental objectives. Um, and also, France is not alone in this. There's a number of OECD countries that have been using these green budgeting tools to provide kind of a green perspective to their recovery plans. Um, and also, interestingly, countries have been offering environmental conditionality for recovery support um, to different critical industries such as aviation or also um, to the automobile industry to try to really promote uh, the use of cleaner energy and cleaner technology. Another example is that um, in countries such as, I think, Colombia, we have Denmark and um, Portugal and, and perhaps Spain, they've been um, documenting these impact assessments on how there are both the positive and negative impacts of uh, these relief measures on the environment. Um, so relief measure, measures such as the COVID distribution, COVID vaccine distribution, as well as the supply chain, um, but also maybe more positive examples of um, the impact on the lack of international travel and also domestic and urban travel on uh, air pollution and air quality standards. So I know I've, I've gone through this rather quickly, but I want to make sure that there's a good enough time for um, some discussion before we end. Um, but I think really just to end, um, we can, countries can really capitalize on this opportunity, but to not just focus on these measures for COVID-19, but also to rather uh, make sure that these measures are part of a broader sustainability plan for reform um, and also hopefully uh, increase the environmental action for health uh, as part of these and as part of these economic relief measures. Thank you. Back to you, Susan. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I think I think a, a part of this agenda is clearly um, a, a defragmentation, um, both uh, in terms of across the health sector, but across the overall uh, government sector. Uh, as well and how we think about these issues and, and particularly in looking towards the future. So um, I think this question of the political window of opportunity that, uh, that COVID potentially uh, presents, uh, there's a lot of action that's needed to go on behind that. So before we have a couple of minutes for discussion. And so there had been some, um, some questions that came in about this terminology question related to the commons. And so I wanted to give Joe, we've had some um, Q&A in the, in the discussion forum, but Joe, I don't know if you want to come in um, quickly to provide a little bit of clarification as well on, on some of these terminology questions. Sure, thanks very much. And thanks to everybody for an interesting uh, set of presentations and, and good feedback from our small but committed audience. Uh, I think, you know, it, it has been a challenge because the, the terminology that's used comes from kind of the core of economics about the definition of market failures, which is actually not a judgment, but just simply a description of a certain type of, of characteristic of market interaction that generally results in underinvestment. And I think this is really the, the concern here that to some extent, it's not a surprise that countries have not invested adequately um, in these functions uh, because that's what we would kind of expect as a consequence of market failures. Both the, 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 and it really requires then a political initiative to go beyond the expressed demand of, of individuals and, and to be able to kind of make the necessary investments. And I, I do think, and this came up in one of the questions that the common goods definition and, and challenge 
um, what was described, I think, in Leanne Brady's question around the tragedy of the commons, is this, this potential for that we see for depleting um, those available resources, this critical issue, obviously, with environment, for example, to overuse the commons to, to have these kind of uh, problems in that sense. And also, and, and I think uh, David Peters just answered the question from uh, Hoda, which was really that the 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 multifaceted. If I I'm, this this may be wrong, but just in interpreting it, the multifaceted nature of um, a lot of the interventions actually is a challenge mm -hmm. for doing the kind of um, cost effectiveness analysis that we might do with more narrower narrower discrete and more frequently occurring types of interventions around personal services. So there's a, a number of issues I think that have come up that relate to uh, why underinvestment happens. I think a critical one, which Gavin also mentioned, and, and we could think of it within large countries such as India, which Grace talked about, is when you get these um, cross-border externalities. I mean, I'm thinking of this in India of how air pollution in Delhi is coming from Rajasthan and then which state is actually, how to ensure that that gets done is a critical kind of both political, technical uh, financing challenge, I think that has to be addressed. Uh, and really, I think what we're trying to do in this whole area of work is to build political momentum for something that simply has not gotten sufficient attention. So anyway, let me let me stop there and turn it back over to to you, Susan, and, and speakers, if, if you want to address any of the other questions. Okay, wonderful. Uh, no, thank you so much. So I'm I'm aware of the time, and I know we have uh, Dr. Awad Mataria to to provide some closing reflections and some summary remarks. And so I want to make sure that we, because I understand that we're cut off right at eleven fifteen, um, and so. Um, I, Awad, if you want to come in now, um, if you're there, there you are. Okay. Uh, I think you're muted. We can't hear you. I see you're not muted, but we can't hear you. <laughs> okay. No, we can't hear you now. Hmm. Might be a mic issue. Yeah. You quickly check your microphone. No. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Now? Yes. Wonderful. I disconnected. Then I can't report again. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, really, really a great session. Thank you very much, colleagues, for having me and for the great presentations and the insights that have been given by different colleagues and the comments that have been put in the in the chat. I mean, for me, this topic is really very, very timely. And the discussion that we have been having and will continue to have for some time is, is very, very important. And I very much first appreciate that we are bringing in this subject to a conference, to a symposium, like the Health System Research Symposium. Because this is a question that is, requires still a lot of research. And it's great that we are connected and we, we have many researchers around who would uh, hopefully take this idea and further elaborate it, further investigate it, and try it at different, different country, country settings. Of course, as we all know, um, now we are all uh, in a situation where countries are thinking about how to build back, how to rebuild their health systems. We are using different qualifications, like building back better, building back fairer now is coming, coming to, the, to, the, to the surface. But in all, in all cases, countries know that they have to build their health systems and rebuild them in a different way than how they used to do that in the, in, in, in the past. And what is also um, uh, interesting to notice is that many of the things that we have been advocating for at the global level, different researchers, different health advocates have now proven to be very, very timely needed. I'm referring to things like public health, things like social participation, the importance of community uh, mobilization and communities and their role in, in service delivery in, 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 health, in health systems. So, so all of this really is becoming uh, very, um, very important, and many policymakers will have you will have the, the, the ears of policymakers if we when we address these issues now, and they, I'm sure they will be taking them more uh, more seriously. So Tolbert in his uh, in, in presentation has also emphasized things that we have been talking about as part 
of uh, aid effectiveness, like when he referred to the one plan, one budget, the importance of coordination. So all of these are things that we would like, we need to package them in, in, in a certain proper way to be properly presented to policymakers to take them uh, forward. I guess the challenge that we are all faced with now is how to bring in the two distinct words of emergency preparedness and health system strengthening. It has for, forever, it has been uh, the situation when we, when we talk about humanita humanitarian response, we leave development aside. Or when we talk about development, it is in a situation where there is no emergencies, things are stable, and we need to move, to move uh, uh, for, uh, forward with, with development. I think that this is, this is what we need to focus on, how to bring in these two together. And this is, for me, this is, might sound easier. It is easier said than, 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 than done. Uh, I guess what the agenda of universal health coverage and now the opportunity, if I may use the word, uh, that is presented by, by COVID is making it easier to bring the two uh, goals of universal health coverage and preparedness as dual goals for health system uh, strengthening. So, so the point that I would like to share, and I is following up on what has been said by the different, different colleagues, is that in rethinking our health systems for the future, we need to design them in a way that they deliver on the goals of universal health coverage that we have always been talking about uh, now and we have been properly formulated, but also to add goals related to health security, goals related to emergency pre uh, preparedness. And those, I think that people who have worked in a humanitarian setting and in emergency uh, uh, response, they have their own frame of mind, their own, own way of thinking. They usually do things on the, on the spot because they have to respond to, to emergency. And it's not easy always, I'm, I'm, I'm facing that now, with experts working in this area to come up with them with the clear goals on what they want to achieve as part of the health security agenda and to align those with the requirements from a health system uh, point of view. So for, for me, the, the way forward, and this links to the great session that we had on common goods for health, is how to go about investing in the basics, investing in the foundations of what is proven to be cost effective. I mean, David has referred to that, to that and Gavin has uh, shared evidence from the um, uh, Commission on investing, investing in Health. So these are things that are proven to be uh, cost effective. And so how to, how to invest in them or how to go about implementing those at country level. So for me, I guess the, the magic solution um, uh, is into defining those concretely. So we have been talking, I mean, common goods for health and essential public health functions, I may use the other term, um, have been there in the, in the literature, but they had often remained upstream. So when we talk about um, issues related to policy coordination, so how, how, how to go about implementing this at, concretely on the ground at a country, at a country level? So we need to frame those, we need to define them uh, concretely, and we need to ensure that they are integrated within, if I may say, the benefit packages that are delivered by, by health system, uh, taking into account that the definition of health system might need to change as well, and to ensure that, that there is enough funding for them, but there is also the proper governance arrangement that ensures their implementation and their proper, proper follow-up. So I find this really exciting, and I think that the next time when uh, hopefully we'll be able to meet all face-to-face -face in 2022, we'll be able to deliver on concrete country examples on how we countries have went about um, implementing those common goods for health for better health outcomes. Again, thank you very much, Susan, Joe, all colleagues for this opportunity and looking forward to stay connected with all of you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Awad. And, and yes, thanks to the, the committed attendees and, and of course to all the speakers and who have been uh, involved in this, but also for many years in this work. And we look forward to, as we move into I think this idea behind the operationalization of these concepts. And so we've kind of are beyond the point of talking about the, the why they're important. I think we're trying to get more specific in terms of what these functions are. But in terms of the operational side, I think it came out clearly across the speakers that while we're making the case for these population-based functions, they're clearly connected with other, other investment areas, whether it's the health system or um, environmental protection or water and sanitation services. And so I think that the question now is how can the case be made in an operational sense? So the what and the how, and I think that we're working through that um, within WHO, but also with collaboration um, with the World Bank and, and IMF and others, but, but importantly, what makes sense in countries in terms of that, that dialogue and, 
in terms of how do we break down some of the fragmentation and support the PFM systems that actually align behind these common platforms. Um, and, and I know that we frame this agenda around financing, but I do think that what comes out across is the, the really the collective action failures um, that are really inherent within a lot of these goods uh, and functions and in terms of the governance related challenges. And so what is the role of communities and individuals? And then what is the role of kind of the regulatory role of the state? Um, whether that state is at the national level, the subnational level, the global level. And so these are some of the issues that I think are really going to have to be taken up um, very clearly um, and, and forthrightly in, in terms of the next steps um, in hopes of, of really kind of not, as I said, not being back in this conversation again and not referencing quotes from this session a couple of years from now or 10 years from now. Um, so thank you again, uh, and I wish you all a wonderful day, evening, sleep, wake up, um, and we look forward to being in touch. Hi, everybody. Bye. Bye. Get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. I'm awake now. Thank, thank you all. Back to work.